Hello, art historians, and welcome to our second part of our lecture of post-impressionism, where we're going to start stepping away from post-impressionism and moving into a reaction to post-impressionism, which is going to be symbolism. And one thing I really, really need you to understand in terms of what symbolism is and how it differs from post-impressionism is post-impressionists like Cezanne and Van Gogh were still trying to show the natural world. They were trying to show things that are recognizable that you could see. They're just seeing it in their own way. We're being to, subjected to the way that they see it. So for exam, example, Cezanne sees it in shapes, whereas Van Gogh sees it in kind of swirls of color and movement and explosions. But now we're moving into symbolism. And the big difference in symbolism is we are seeing things that are only in the mind of the artist, all right? So yes, they may look natural, like it could be a scene that maybe you could encounter, but really what we're seeing is going on inside of the head of the artist. And just like with post-impressionism, symbolism is very subjective. Like we are being subjected to the way that not only they see the world, which is post-impressionism, but what they see inside of themselves, all right? And their use of color, line, shape, um, light, etc. all of that has to do with what is going on inside of their head. And so in order to do that, we're going to start looking at Paul Gauguin, who kind of steps a fine line between post-impressionism, because he did work a lot with artists like Van Gogh, but his true works, the one that we know him for the best, um, are going to be his works of art that are definitely symbolic in nature. So Paul Gauguin, I'm not going to lie to you guys, I hate teaching Gauguin. Gauguin is a huge self-promoter. He is very much an opportunist. Um, he just sounds like a spoiled brat to me most of the time. Like he had things going well for him and then those things fell apart. Um, that's just personal. I don't like him. And I think one of the reasons I'm able to say I don't like him very much is because he is so open about what's going on inside of his head. Um, Edvard Monk is completely different in that regard. Um, but Gauguin is definitely going to be a huge self promoter and almost like opportunistic of the things that he believed happened to him. Right. So Gauguin, a little bit about him, he was actually um, involved in the business world and started out with works of art that were actually quite realistic. Um, and then he was involved in or was working for the stock market when the stock market crashed in Paris and he lost a lot of money and lost his job. And he developed this idea that civilization destroys everything. And he wanted to go back to what he believed was an untouched, uncorrupted society. And where he, he traveled all over to find that. So first he went to um, Brittany, which is um, this area in Europe where he felt he could achieve inspiration, that they had a whole bunch of like early medieval styles. He really liked stained glass. He liked, um, to him, those were the good old days before corrupt, you know, society was corrupted and things like that. But then he ended up leaving behind his wife and his children, who he basically left destitute to go live in Tahiti, which Tahiti to him had not been corrupted by French imperialism yet. It was um, just the perfect symbolic idea of what society should be with innocence and freedom and, you know, this fascination with um, stories and legends. Like, he liked that. And so that's where he found a lot of his inspiration in painting. But while he was there, he took a great number of child brides, very young women, um, and painted them a lot, which is why I have you guys do the um, Should Gauguin Be Shown? His works of art, there's actually debates on whether Gauguin's works of art should still be shown because we know what it's about, kind of along the same lines as Venus of Urbino. But symbolically, what, what was inside Gauguin's heart is he wanted to return to a primitive time and the primitive art styles that go with that and primitive places. So Tahiti was his primitive place. 
He really liked the cloisson technique of melting down these pieces of glass or stone or jewels and fitting them into like wire, kind of like we saw with like Viking art um, and also stained glass. He thought that was a primitive style of art. And so when we see Gauguin paint and everything that he is painting, yes, the stuff that he's painting could be recognizable to it, but he's everything that he's using, the color and the people that he paints and the places are all symbolic of what's going on in his head. All right. So symbolists, this is where they differ from post-impressionists. They're a little bit more free with color because they're really not trying to paint the natural world. They may still paint things that we recognize, like we can recognize this right here is Jesus on a cross, but we can see that it's people dressed in almost colonial clothing, so we can recognize that. So obviously these two things wouldn't have been together. So there's more of a symbolic meaning to it like every form every color the way that he does things and Gauguin is very clear because he almost separates his colors to a fault like they're very blocky pieces of color like you can see where it's almost like very thickly outlined and that's because he likes stained glass and enamel and melting down enamel to fit shapes because symbolically to him that was a primitive untouched civilized time and an untouched civilized you know untouched art form so he's symbolically doing it the same way as he would see in more primitive times by not blending the colors together not blurring them together like titian would so there's even symbolism in the way that he paints so again keep in mind that symbolism like post-impressionism is very subjective we are being subjective to in post-impressionism, the way that they see the natural world, and in symbolism, we're being subjected to what's going on inside their heads, all right? So there's a term called synesthism. We're basically, we're synthesizing two things together. The way that a work is painted, the colors being used, the elements and principles being used are being synthesized with an emotion, idea, or feeling that um, a person has. So think about this for a second. Gauguin likes to use these blocks of color. He doesn't blend them together. He doesn't shade them together. He just paints in these big blocks of color. That's very childlike, right? So it's almost actually the way that, um, like my children, when they color in coloring books, that's what it is. Like there's no shading. It's just coloring in these blocks. And what Gauguin wants is a more primitive, simple, time so just even the way that he's painting is joined together with his vision of this more primitive time this childlike time and also like in europe earlier art forms like the cloison technique or stained glass or things like that so he's synthesizing his feelings and thoughts and beliefs and desires with the way that he paints and not only the way that he paints but also what he paints he's not trying to make anything look naturalistic at all is some of it realistic sure we could realistically see you know women like this but at the same time there's also some very unrealistic things that he puts in here things that you would never actually see these guys don't like impressionists impressionists are painting the real world they're painting it as they see it as the eye sees it in color post impressionists are painting the world as they see it, these guys are painting the world, or their world, basically, their thoughts, their ideas, their feelings. So Gauguin, the reason that he loved Tahiti so much is this is an area that hadn't been colonized by anybody yet. Like it was still very much a primitive society where people were still living off the land. It was you know, a very native culture. And this is where he found paradise to him. He's like, this is what paradise is supposed to be. It's supposed to be untouched. And remember, this guy just lost all his money in the stock market. So he's really just mad, all right? Um, so to him, this was French Tahitian islands. The French culture hadn't impeded this yet as far as he was concerned. There were still people dressing in native dress. They were still practicing native cultures. They weren't all tied up in the materialism of the European world. Um, he liked to, you know, focus on not only the people, but also painting their dreams and their visions and their religion. So what was going on inside their head? 
Um, so, for example, there was this belief um, in Tahitian culture when the lights go out that the spirits of the dead can come and watch over people. So sometimes he would paint someone sleeping, but then also at the same time, the spirit of the dead watching over them. And remember, he doesn't use color naturalistically because this is his, it's symbolic, right? And again, this guy was disgusting in how his relationships with young girls. So, you know, the use of color red, you know, is passion and, you know, things like that paired with, you know, these young girls. And then also the white of the innocence, which is just, just, just ugh, I can't, I can't handle it. All right. Um, but anyway, all right. So looking here, you can see number one, Gauguin, those huge big blocks of color, like just, you know, almost like the color is very separated, even where he looks like he tries to shade it together. And these Tahitian girls are symbolic of youth and primitivism and untouched and just ugh, all right but then you'll notice that the river behind them is red and this could be the encroachment like the approach of death or the passion of the river flowing or it could be blood of some kind or it could be the threat of you know people up you know french culture appearing and he'll use forms like the trees and the river to kind of separate, you know, different things and kind of create, you know, different, almost creating in his paintings a separation between the real world and the imaginary world. But again, even though Tahiti does exist, he's not painting Tahiti like he was just sitting there painting the landscape. He was using Tahiti and the people in it as a symbol for his own feelings. So again, Gauguin, what he paints and how he paints it is all symbolic. He's using recognizable things. Like we know it's Tahiti. We know that this is actually, this is um, the spirit of the dead keeping watch. And you'll see here that it's this young woman that he walked in on who was having a nightmare and her eyes are open. But then there's the imaginary world behind her of the spirits of the dead keeping watch. Um, just everything is symbolic. You have to understand that about him. And this is a picture just to show you who this guy was. Here he is in Tahiti with child brides, young girls, while his wife and children are starving over in Europe. So this is why I really hate teaching this guy. But the work of art that they've picked for the 250 is where do we come from? Where are we going? All right. And this painting is his magnum opus like this is what he actually painted this he was going to kill himself and actually probably tried he kept ingesting arsenic to kill himself and arsenic actually just builds up in your stomach over time it's a slower way to die it's not fast um but he had lost one of his children which he was over in tahiti so okay but he was going to commit suicide and then he painted this painting and apparently it was so good that he decided to stay alive because he was going to send it over to Europe because he thought it was just truly, truly amazing. All right. So basically what we're looking here, this entire painting as a whole is symbolic of his contemplation of life. Who are we? Where do we come from? Where are we going? Like he's just actually contemplating these questions in his head. All right. And he's looking at basically the beginning of life in terms of, and this entire thing right here is some people interpret, because remember we're interpreting what's going on inside his mind, the garden of Eden, like to him, Tahiti was Eden. Like it was this place of paradise. Um, and we had left it and we had been corrupted by society. So he had gone back to Eden and there's interpretations that this is kind of like the progression of life. And he uses different forms to divide the different stages of life up. So it's meant to be read from right to left. Okay. So not left to right, but right to left. So almost like going back to a more primitive time like not in, even in a way that civilized people read from left to right. We're going right to left. And you can see here that there is a baby who was born innocent. And then we go to left and he uses that body, that blocky color of body of possibly Eve picking the fruit. 
and then in this paradise. So this is maybe the Tahitian paradise. And then we keep moving after the fall of society. And this is where sin comes in. And this is where corruption comes in. And we're contemplating our place in this world and what's going to happen to us. And then you'll notice there over on the far left is an older woman. Her hair is white and she has her head in her hands and she's kind of embraced symbolically that she she symbolizes death and acceptance of death. And there's all these you'll notice that there's this blue deity that almost looks like, you know, an Indian god or a pharaoh or an Egyptian god because it's kind of this idea of, you know, which gods do we worship and kind of that embracing of primitive cultures and Indians believe in reincarnation and Egyptians have this belief in you know, life after death. So it's contemplating what happens to us after we die. And then the old woman is symbolically the acceptance of that. So symbolically, this entire painting and how he paints it and the forms that he use symbolizes his struggle with what we go through. Where do we come from? Where are we going? Who are we? And you'll notice that up in the top corners, he's got two areas that um, look like they've peeled off, like they're like almost like there was a gold background, which that's kind of like Byzantine or stained glass windows, but it almost looks like the paint has chipped away. And therefore those gold, one of it has his name in it, um, is kind of meant to look like the erosion of time. Like, you know, the painting is so old, it's starting to erode and go away. So I hope you can see that how he paints it, what he paints, this whole painting's a symbol. And everything in it is symbolic of something else. And you can even see the colors start to get darker as we move towards death and the acceptance of death. Okay, Gauguin was so proud of this painting that he wrote about it a lot. Like the guy wrote about it so much. All right, and these are a couple of things that I have found that people have written about it that it is a meditation on the stages of life, symbolic of Tahiti as the Garden of Eden. The old woman could be guilt and shame of humanity before he arrived in Tahiti. Baby on the right could be the innocence of primitive life. So we don't know that for sure. That's just one interpretation. A figure pr picking fruit shows of what corrupts and leads to the fall of humanity um, to find knowledge outside of the garden. So like, the Garden of Eden is obviously based in Judeo-Christianity and Islam, so maybe we go searching for other answers and other faiths, like it looks like Vishnu, you know, or Shiva in the background, or Egyptian symbols, and the colors draw emphasis to certain things throughout this, all right? Um, by the way, the man also had syphilis, which for the record rots the lining of your brain, which causes insanity, so just to throw that out there too. He said about this painting, remember, he was going to kill himself, but then this painting was so awesome, you know, he's going to sell it and, you know, stay alive. I worked day and night that whole month in an incredible fever. Lord knows it is not done. Sketch after nature, preparatory cartoon. It's all done from imagination, straight from the brush on sackcloth. All right. He didn't do this on canvas. That's an important part of this. He did it on sackcloth so that it looks knotted and wrinkled because life isn't smooth. It is rough and wrinkled. So even the material he used to make this is symbolic. All right. Just take a look at some of the things that he he described it. This, so on the left in the white is him describing his own painting. And on the right is what he said about it. I just have to read this. I look at it incessantly and I admit I admire it. The more I study it, the more I realize it's enormous mathematical faults, which I will not correct at any price, which means he's not trying to make it look naturalistic and mathematically painting. The painting will stay as it is as a sketch, if you wish. She's like, I'm not trying to make it look naturalistic because it's not meant to be. So on the left side, if you want to pause it, is where he tells us what is going on in it, where we're able to understand the way that it's meant to be read. So where do we come from? Where are we going? We kind of covered all of this. Um, I'll let you look over this slide if you want to, because I've already kind of talked about it. I will add one thing in though, and that is the, um, the Japanese influence is very much here with those solid blocks of color and the lack of emphasis on um, natural perspective 
All right, so he also would have been influenced by Japanese appearance at the time. And it almost is like Gauguin didn't know where he was going in life when he painted this because it almost seems unfinished. Like, he's like, I didn't know where I was going. I thought I was going to die. I didn't know where I was going to end up, but here we are. All right, so Gauguin is a really good step into symbolism during this time, and symbolism became picked up very heavily in the early um, 1900s, late 1800s, because of Sigmund Freud. And Sigmund Freud in psychology was very interested in looking into what lies underneath, um, that what we paint or what we draw or what we say is really reflective of something we're not even aware is in our brain, like things that we're doing. He's very into the subconscious. And so symbolism became very popular because of Freud. And Freud also took on symbolism because he could have people describe their dreams or things that they had said or done and then figure out, okay, I hear you saying this is why you did it, but what if it's because you really feel this way and you just aren't aware of it? So because of that, symbolism is going to become pretty popular, which is where we're going to get to the work of Edvard Munch. And oh my goodness, Edvard Munch, this poor guy, um, you kind of have to understand his background to understand Munch as a symbolist and how he developed his style. Edvard Munch's mother died of tuberculosis when he was five. And then he was raised by his father who had severe mental illness, which left a great deal of anxiety in Edvard Munch. Like he was just a very anxious, worried, stressed. He was surrounded by death and instability. Like today we would say that he had faced serious trauma as a child, like serious trauma. And what he paints and how he paints are very symbolic of that trauma and that inner turmoil that goes on inside of him. Now, this is a big difference from Van Gogh. Van Gogh paints the natural world, like his, he, he paints what he sees, right? So he's painting, um, you know, from looking out of his mental institution window or he's painting Paris streets. He's just painting it in the way that he sees it. That's not the case with Edvard Munch. Munch is painting his anxiety. He's painting his stress. He's painting his worry. The way that the colors swirl and go is almost like this endless anxiety that's going on inside of his head. And the feelings that he's experiencing and the stress and the worry that he goes through. So he actually, this quote by Monk just really bothers me. He says, illness, insanity, and death were the black angels that kept watch over my cradle and accompanied me all my life. This man suffered so much as a child that, you know, there's there's great studies in trauma affected um, children where their heart rate, their resting heart rate, even when they're asleep because they've experienced so much trauma um, is higher than a person who hasn't experienced trauma that was, you know, running at full speed like their their body and their brain just never slows down. It's almost like a post traumatic stress. And Edvard Monk is a great example of that, that the way that he paints, the colors that he paints are symbolic of not an actual event, um, but really the feeling that he's having. So obviously the most famous for Edvard Monk is The Scream, right? And that's this one right here, which has been claimed to be the second most popular painting ever created. In fact, it's been stolen a couple of times. Um, next to the Mona Lisa, probably the most famous painting that people recognize. And he said, I was walking along the road with two friends. The sun went down. I felt a gust of melancholy. Suddenly the sky turned a bloody red. I stopped, leaned against the railing, tired to death as the flaming skies hung like blood and sward over the blue black fjord in the city. My friends went on. I stood there trembling with anxiety and I felt a vast infinite scream through nature. So like you can almost, he's painting the scream. He's not painting somebody screaming. He's painting a scream that a scream swirls and moves. And he's painting the anxiety of the red sky and the angles are disjointing. Like he is symbolically using color and form to paint a scream and to paint internal anxiety. All right. 
So he's from Norway, which is why he talks about the fjords. So if you're a fan of Frozen, right, that kind of comes into that. And he he lost his mother. He he didn't have any close relationships. His sister, his father was, you know, tried to raise him, was just not very good at it. And he created this Freeze of Life, which is a great number of paintings that were all put together that was kind of autobiographical. And he did it in different mediums. So, for example, this is the scream in print, but we've seen it in oil, tempura, pastels. And this goes together as kind of like this autobiography of what he was feeling. He's painting a scream with like the lines you know, going different directions, the face of the person screaming, the anxiety, the colors clashing. He's painting a feeling, right? Everything that he's painting is not how he sees it externally. It's what he's feeling internally. This one is The Storm, which is not on the 250, but I just think it's very powerful by Edvard Munch, where you can see that the the wind is swirling and there's this anxiety and stress of these people in Norway whose husbands were fishermen and not knowing if they were going to come back or not. So he's not painting a storm, he's painting the feelings of the storm, of this uncertainty of what the storm was bringing. So this is just another example of it where you can see he's, you know, truly, you know, expressing what he's feeling inside through the lines, the colors, the swirling lines, the instability, like his stuff never stops moving, just like his anxiety never stopped either. Um, it's just constant movement. There's nothing that's still within it. So please remember, one of the biggest things that I can have you guys take away from this is post-impressionist symbolists were considered a type of post-impressionist. They just, they don't paint the natural world. They may use the natural world, things that we would naturally see like, oh, that's Tahiti or, oh, that's a cross or that's, you know, a, a fjord or a fence. But they use it to represent what's going on inside of themselves. And post-impressionist and symbolists are very subjective. Like we're being subjected to their thoughts, their ideas, or the way that they see the world. So while post-impressionists are, this is how we see the world, symbolists are this is what we want you to see what's inside of us we want you to see not only the real world but the imaginary world as well 